A major upgrade to American-Japanese relations. That's what President Biden announces as he hosts Japanese leader Fumio Kishida at the White House. And how the ramped-up alliance aims to help counter the Chinese communist regime. The head of the FBI warns that China is America's biggest threat. The Chinese Communist Party could be preparing to launch cyber attacks and U.S. businesses are a prime target. The Israeli military confirms it struck and killed three sons of the leader of Hamas in an airstrike today, saying they were operatives for the militant group. Severe thunderstorms are expected across parts of the Gulf Coast, from Louisiana to the Florida Panhandle today. The National Weather Service warns of potential tornadoes. U.S. consumer prices increased more than expected in March as Americans paid more for gasoline and rental housing. Welcome to NTD Newsroom. I'm Stephanie Cox, hosting Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida for a state visit. President Biden announced a ramped up level of defense and intelligence cooperation with the key Indo-Pacific ally. The historic upgrade of the alliance aims to send a message to communist China. Here's what President Biden said at a joint press conference at the White House. I'm also pleased to announce that for the first time, Japan and the United States and Australia will create a network system of air, missile, and defense architecture. We're also looking forward to standing up a trilateral military exercise with Japan and the United Kingdom. And our office defense... Biden also says that AUKUS, a security pact among Australia, the UK, and the US, is exploring ways for Japan to join. The closer ties come amid growing aggression from communist China, especially in the South China Sea. Here's Biden praising Japan for standing with the U.S. in that region. Standing strong with the United States as we stand up for freedom of navigation, including in the South China Sea, and as we maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. On Thursday, Biden and Kishida will be joined by the Philippines leader for a first trilateral summit among the three countries. The Biden administration says it's seeking to flip the script and counter China's efforts to isolate U.S. allies. With the growing number of Chinese espionage activities in America, the director of the FBI says China is the country's biggest threat. Christopher Wray yesterday emphasized the Chinese Communist Party's cybersecurity threat at a gathering of the American Bar Association. China's hackers have been positioning on American infrastructure in preparation to wreak havoc and cause real-world harm to American citizens and communities. Today, we're seeing China's increasing build-out of offensive weapons within our critical infrastructure, setting up persistent PRC access in our critical sectors like telecommunications, energy, water, poised to attack whenever Beijing decides the time is right. Ray says China's cyber program is larger than that of every other major nation. China's hackers outnumber FBI cyber personnel by 50 to 1 and have been prepared to launch cyber attacks against American oil and natural gas companies ever since 2011. The Chinese Communist Party is concentrating all its efforts on undermining the, the economy and security of free democratic countries. Ray also said that the CCP often uses espionage, foreign inter foreign influence and election interference in tandem, and that American businesses are a prime target. The Israeli military confirms it killed three sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh, saying they were operatives for the militant group. The military said the airstrike happened Wednesday. It described the men as a cell commander and two military operatives. Haniyeh's sons are among the highest profile figures to die in the war so far. Hamas is telling ceasefire negotiators that it's currently unable to identify and track down 40 living Israeli hostages needed for the first phase of a ceasefire deal. The announcement is raising fears that more hostages may be dead than are publicly known. The 129 hostages still being held by Hamas, 33 of them are known to be dead, according to Israeli leaders. 
The hostages to be released include all of the women as well as sick and elderly men. In exchange, hundreds of Palestinian prisoners would be released from Israeli prisons. Most Americans are worried about illegal immigration. That's what more and more polls are now finding leading up to this year's election. President Biden now says he might take executive action to tackle the issue. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the details. Over 7 million people entered the U.S. illegally under President Biden. That's more than the population of 36 individual states. Now the president tells Spanish-speaking TV station Univision that he might take executive action. Take a look. There's no guarantee that I have that power all by myself without legislation. And some have suggested I should just go ahead and try it. And if I get shut down by the court, I get shut down by the court. But we're trying to work, that, work through that right now. The exact details of Biden's potential executive order are not clear yet. But Axios reports that he plans to restrict the ability of immigrants to claim asylum and that this would not need congressional approval. The president reportedly plans to issue the order in April. Arian Pastar, NTD News. And joining us now for more on the immigrant crisis at the southern border is NTD News contributor Mike Leon. He's the policy and strategy director of the Free and the Equal Elections Foundation and host of the news commentary podcast, Can We Please Talk? Mike, good to see you as always. Biden in a 2021 ordered a pause on all wall construction within a week. One of 17 executive orders issued on his first day in office, as we all know, including six dealing with immigration. Biden claims that he needs the help of lawmakers to curb the border crisis. Do you think that's the case? Hey, Steph, good to see you first and foremost. So, I mean, I think it's yes and a no answer, which is the first time I think I've ever said that sentence out loud, because like he just alluded to, and you kind of heard in the package there what the president was saying to Televisa Univision was the fact that they think that the challenges in the court system that this don't this won't fly on its merit now we've had a couple of challenges during the trump administration that were upheld and then the remain in mexico policy president biden kind of removed that and the court upheld that that dhs had the ability to remove that policy so it's a yes and no answer i think president biden's team right now is weighing whether or not they can go ahead and write this action and, and uh, file it under the Immigration and Nationality Act and really, you know, curb the amount of asylum seekers in the U.S. and then just wait for it to be actually challenged in the courts by advocacy groups and the like. And I think, to be honest with you, he should. We've heard CBP and other uh, enforcement agents on the border, and specifically patrol agencies on these towns, say that they're they're getting overwhelmed and they need help and they need the president to do something because Congress hasn't been able to do anything. Yeah, this is an unprecedented situation. And considering that he is the one in charge here, uh, what do you think right. Americans really should be demanding of him? Well, that's a great question right there. I mean, because, I, you know, you were talking about the polling before. There was a recent Gallup poll that showed about 28% of the respondents in the poll back in February said that immigration was their top issue. So the president of the United States, you know, if you can't wait for Congress, issue an executive order. This is what the Trump administration was doing. This is what even President Biden alluded to that he had done in the early onset stages of when he first came into office. Now, again, presidents always get criticized later on after they've left office about how many executive orders they've issued. President Obama, I believe, issued around 60 or 70 in his first term. And so we're, we're always going to look back and say whether or not these worked. But here is an actual issue right now that Congress just has not been able to solve. You heard in the in the package, or if you didn't watch the interview with Televisa on Univision, he mentioned about the Senate bill with Senator James Lankford. You and I have spoken about about it, Steph, that bill would have done certain things to free up the backlog of cases and to add more border aid. It didn't even make it into the House. So the president has to take this on his own right now because this is a campaign issue and he is campaigning to get reelected. And this is an issue that many respondents are saying is at the top of their list in terms of immigration and the economy. Yeah, we'll need to see how this all pans out in terms of the election and how much weight it has there. But I want to turn now to the House delaying its uh, sending articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate. That's set for next week. What are the prospects for this attempt, do you think, looking at it so far? 
Well, I mean, you know, I've talked to historians and analysts that have analyzed, you know, the history of how we use impeachment in this country. And each of them have all told me that this is not the way to go about it, right? A policy disagreement doesn't necessarily uh, force an impeachment. And impeachment is high crimes and misdemeanors. Now, we can debate whether or not Alejandro Mayorkas hasn't done his duty with respect to what has happened at the U.S. southern border. That's a different issue altogether. I don't know, and I think the House is waiting, and Speaker Johnson has said this, you've heard some other Republican lawmakers, John Thune has said this, uh, Kennedy has said this as well, that they just don't know if they have enough you know, to pass this in the Senate. And so I think Speaker Johnson is kind of waiting to see what will play out, because remember, Congress was on a recess over the last couple of weeks. There hasn't been much chatter on this. This is their first week back in the chamber. So I think they're just waiting another week to try to see what they can corral in terms of votes and putting this all together to be able to get it into a Senate trial. But but uh, Majority Leader Schumer said they're ready to operate on this because they feel that this is political posturing in terms of the impeachment of the secretary. As we saw from the last vote, every vote counts for this impeachment and, and seems like these lawmakers are very set on finding some way forward. So we'll keep an eye on that. Thank you so much, Mike Leon. Thanks, Steph. Former President Donald Trump arrived in Atlanta today for a fundraiser with prominent GOP donors and supporters. Trump's plane touched down before noon Wednesday with his supporters waiting to greet him on the tarmac. While meeting them, Trump spoke about Biden's performance on the economy. He told the crowd that inflation continues to rise because of Biden's lack of control of the U.S. economy. Biden has totally lost control of inflation. It's back. It's raging back. The number today was very high, very bad. It's actually much higher because they exclude various categories. It's actually much higher than that. Former CFO of the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg, has been sentenced to five months in jail after he pleaded guilty to perjury charges. Weisselberg was accused of lying twice during former President Donald Trump's civil fraud trial, including in a deposition. In July 2022, he deceived investigators over knowing in advance that Trump's triplex apartment had been overvalued. This penalty comes on the top of a five-month sentence that Weisselberg is already serving for tax fraud charges. That's related to alleged tax evasion over a 15-year scheme worth $1.7 million. The Trump Organization and its former associates were previously ordered to pay more than $350 million in damages. Trump appealed the decision and a state court appeals court reduced his bond amount to $175 million, which he has posted. Severe thunderstorms are expected today across parts of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle. The National Weather Service warned of potential tornadoes and winds exceeding 75 miles per hour. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the latest on significant damage in the region. Drone footage showed flooding in Belton, Texas yesterday as storms swept across the state. Today, heavy rain, hail, and tornadoes could hit the Gulf Coast and the Deep South. In Texas, several people were rescued from homes and vehicles this morning due to flooding near the Louisiana state line. An animal shelter was desperate for foster homes after flooding left some dogs stranded in the facility. In the Houston suburb of Katy, part of the roof of a Firestone repair shop collapsed. Storms also damaged businesses and cars in a nearby strip mall. Photos posted on social media showed heavy damage to a church in Port Arthur. City officials there said they were also dealing with downed trees and power lines. In Mississippi, a sheriff sent out an urgent warning to people in parts of Yazoo County, just northwest of Jackson. Residents were warned to flee over fears that a levee would fail. In Louisiana, state office buildings closed today. Drivers were also asked to limit travel if possible and warned that high winds were expected to affect large trucks. More than 100,000 customers in the state were already without power. Another 30,000 customers were without power in Mississippi. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Tennessee state senators passed a bill yesterday allowing teachers and school administrators to carry concealed firearms in public schools. The move comes in the wake of the Covenant school shooting in Nashville last year that killed six people. Senate Speaker Randy McNally cleared the galleries after loud protesters repeatedly refused to quiet down. The bill would allow faculty or staff members to carry a handgun at schools under certain conditions. They would need to or obtain an enhanced handgun carry permit, required authorization from the school principal, and permission from local law enforcement. 
Staff would have to undergo 40 hours of school-specific training. Applicants would need to clear a background check and be certified by a Tennessee licensed health care provider as well. There are new federal restrictions for a group of cancer-causing chemicals called Forever Chemicals. The rules will limit their use in the nation's drinking water supply. The new limits on so-called forever chemicals in the nation's drinking water supply is a first for the federal agency. The class of chemicals is called PFAS. They've been in use since the 1940s and have strong molecular bonds that don't break down for a long time. There are more than 12,000 PFAS chem PFA chemicals. The six that the EPA is restricting are known to cause cancer in humans and animals. The announcement comes with $1 billion in grants to help water systems and private well owners conduct initial testing and treatment. When we come back, U.S. consumer prices increased more than expected in March as Americans paid more for gasoline and rental housing. Those higher prices aren't stopping Americans from having fun, even if that means taking on credit card debt. We'll tell you how much they're spending after the break. What if you could feel in control of your retirement in just a few clicks? At aceyourretirement.org, you can. Start with a free three-minute chat with Avo, your friendly digital retirement coach. Just answer some simple questions like, how do you feel about your ability to save for retirement? Or in how many years do you want to retire? To get free action items customized just for you, get your retirement back on track at aceyourretirement.org. Hi, I'm Susan Lucci. You may know me from my many years on television. I never thought about heart disease until I had my own heart event. I felt this slight pressure in my chest, just slight. I thought, oh, it's nothing, it'll go away. I didn't get it. I did not get it. But a few days later, while shopping at a boutique, that pressure returned much stronger. It felt like an elephant pressing on my chest. I had a 90% blockage in my main artery and a 75% blockage in the adjacent artery. I was rushed into surgery where I received two stents in my arteries. Stents developed through research funded by the American Heart Association. Those stents saved my life. That's why I'm in front of you today, asking you to join me in supporting the American Heart Association by becoming a monthly donor. Call now or go to helpheart.org. For only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you can help fund the next medical breakthrough. Get the next person trained in CPR, the next hospital certified in high quality cardiovascular care. I'm so grateful to the American Heart Association. Their research helped save my life. I can enjoy life with my children, my grandchildren, and my friends. Heart disease is America's number one killer. And your support now can help save your life or the life of someone you love. Give $19 a month with your credit card and we'll send you this special t-shirt that you can wear to show that you are helping save lives. Please listen to your heart. The only reason I'm here today is because I did. So please call the number on your screen or go to helpheart.org now. Join me as a monthly donor today and help save even more lives. Thank you. These are all farmers. Maybe no, not this not one. a farm anymore. But here is a farm, right? No, it is also not a farm anymore. All these people shut down because of the government policies? Yeah. The government wants to control the food, so we don't eat meat, but we eat insects. As the price of staples goes through the roof, people will say, I can't afford a steak anymore. So, all right, I'll, just, I'll eat your stupid crickets. The surge in electricity use is causing concerns among industry executives. They say the increase in the number of data centers around the country is the reason why. Nine of the top ten electric companies in the U.S. anticipate a major increase in power consumption from data centers, especially those that generate AI technology. Electric industry executives say the data centers, along with an increase in demand from the auto industry and the manufacturing sector, is putting a strain on the country's electric grid. 
Some state lawmakers are raising concerns that electric companies will be unable to respond quickly to the rise in power demand due to the growth of data centers that are con connected to the U.S. power grid. And next up, China's outlook downgraded again by another ratings agency. And a new U.S. inflation print shows higher than expected price increases. Here's NTD's Don Ma with today's business brief. All right, thank you very much, Steph. So what I wanted to start off today is with China because ratings agency Fitch downgraded its outlook on the country's credit rating today. It reflects the challenging situation in China's public financing regarding uh, the double whammy, if you will, of decelerating growth and more debt. So Fitch expects China's central and local government debt to rise to about 61% of gross domestic product in 2024. And this is up compared to 2023. And this is a clear deterioration compared to all the way back to 2019. Now, at the same time, the rating agency expects China's general deficit, uh, which, by the way, covers infrastructure and other official fiscal activity outside the headline budget, it expects this to rise to 7.1 percent of GDP in 2024. And this is also up from 2023. And it's the highest since 2020. So lowering its ratings to negative outlook from stable indicates a downgrade is possible over the medium term. Now, Fitch forecast China's economic growth would also slow compared to last year. The outlook downgrade follows uh, similar moves by Moody's uh, in December, and it comes as Beijing ratchets up efforts to spur a feeble post COVID recovery in the world's second largest economy and fiscal monetary policy support. China's finance ministry denounced the downgrade of its outlook to negative. So how are people reacting to this news? Some analysts are saying that China faces some significant structural headwinds associated with inefficient uh, investment, particularly in the property sector. And some are saying that the more immediate impact of adjusting the outlook rating could have uh, an impact on the ability of the Chinese state and enterprises to raise U.S. dollar debt funding. And Steph, one more thing I wanted to talk to you about, and that is inflation. U.S. consumer prices increased more than expected last month amid rising in the cost of gasoline and shelter. And this is casting further doubt on whether the Federal Reserve will start cutting interest rates in June. And here are the details. The consumer price index rose 0.4 percent last month. And this is about the same compared to the previous month, according to the Labor Department's Bureau of Labor Statistics. Now, gasoline and shelter costs, which include rents, accounted for more than half of the increase of the CPI. Now, on a year over year basis, in the 12 months through March, the CPI increased 3.5 percent. That's all from me. Back to you, Steph. Thank you, Don. According to the latest data from the New York Federal Reserve, Americans held more than $1 trillion in credit card balances in the fourth quarter of 2023. Bankrate reports that Americans still want to spend on fun, even if that means going into debt. NTD's Andrew Thomas speaks with a senior industry analyst to learn more. Just because the cost of living is going up doesn't mean consumers will stop living it up. A Bankrate survey published last week reveals that more than a third of Americans are inclined to accept some debt in order to pay for at least one discretionary expense this year. What are your thoughts about this record high, more than $1 trillion of credit card debt, and how did we get here? It sounds pretty shocking on the face of it. The fact that Americans owe $1.13 trillion on their credit cards, the fact that that's up 47% from the beginning of 2021, that's really been a meteoric rise. It's been fueled by inflation and high interest rates. The average credit card charges a record high 20.75%. The pandemic and its aftermath continue to drive demand for travel, so much so that 27% of respondents said they'd be willing to go into the red. I thought 2022 was supposed to be the year of revenge travel, but 2023 had more travel and more concerts. And this year, who knows, maybe this year tops them all. So uh, there's still a lot of pent up demand out there. 13% of respondents said they'd go into debt for a concert, game or similar event. A welcome escape from the day to day struggle against inflation and other financial woes. I actually hear from some young adults that they're 
pessimistic about certain parts of their finances, like their student debt loads and their ability to buy a house, but they want to control what they can. And they say, hey, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to go on the trip. I'm going to go out to eat. I'm going to go to the concert. Rossman says just taking a couple of simple steps can help consumers have a good time without racking up debt. I don't want to tell people they can't have any fun, but I am certainly cognizant of those record high credit card rates and record high credit card debt loads. I think a big part of the advice here is just be prepared, set a good budget, create an entertainment fund. A lot of people don't budget or they only account for the necessities. Set aside money specifically for entertainment. Rossman adds that flexibility is an effective tool to have fun on a budget. And maybe also scale back the plans a little bit. Like, is there a way to go on vacation, but spend a little less? Maybe it's a road trip. Maybe it's a domestic flight instead of a long haul international flight. Maybe you could go in the shoulder season or the off season instead of peak timing. I think there are ways that you can still have fun on a budget. Rossman also recommends that consumers take advantage of perks like credit card rewards and airline miles when they can. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Thank you for watching NTD Newsroom. I'm Stephanie Cox. We'll have more stories from the U.S. and around the world. Join Tiffany Meyer for the NTD Evening News at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific.